right, so tonight we'll be in Acts chapter 9 in the New Testament. And as you know, Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles, plural, I should say. And so no doubt, uh, the Gospel of Luke deals with the ministry of Jesus. It records his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And then Acts of the Apostles tells us what happened after Jesus was crucified, after he was raised from the dead, after he ascended back into heaven. It's sort of the so what of Jesus' work on earth. And the apostles go out as they were assigned by the risen Lord to preach Jesus. And they encounter some persecution along the way. Uh, they encounter opposition. And so we're going to look at some of this opposition. And it came from a man by the name of Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he was born in the province of uh, Cilicia, which would be part of modern-day Turkey. And this records his conversion experience. And this is probably taking place about A.D. 33 to A.D. 36. It's probably a few years, maybe three to five years, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, his name here is Saul. Later, he will call himself Paul. So we surmise then that this fellow by the name of Saul, we surmise that Saul was his Jewish name. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And as you know, the first king of Israel was King Saul. Maybe he was a descendant of King Saul. And we also surmise then that this fellow Saul also had a Greek name. And his Greek name was Paul. So after he becomes a Christian and God sends him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, Saul uses the name Paul instead. So let's read about this. Number one, Saul is busy persecuting the church. So let's read about this. This is Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Then Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. That would be the high priest at the temple in Jerusalem. Verse 2, and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. By the way, that little designation, the way, that's referring to Christians. So this fellow Saul, he, he's Jewish, he runs to the high priest in Jerusalem, he asks for special letters, uh, you might say a permit, if you will, a special permit or a special authorization to go up to the synagogues in Damascus in Syria. And if he finds among these synagogues anybody that's a Christian, whether men or women, he could have them arrested and bound and bring them back to Jerusalem for a trial. As you know, the leaders in Jerusalem didn't like Jesus, and they wanted him crucified. And there's still quite a few leaders around, quite a few people around, that don't like this new movement started by Jesus. And they want to try to stamp it out. And one of these people was uh, this fellow by the name of Saul. And then I have a few cross-references. If you just want to back up a little bit in Acts, notice chapter 8. Just to get a sense here of uh, what Saul has been doing. Notice back in chapter 8, verse 3, that text says, Well, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Saul had no qualms about arresting women and putting them in jail. Wow, this fellow has no mercy. And then if you go to chapter 22... For a moment, if you want to just turn to chapter 22, keep your finger in Acts 9. But in chapter 22, uh, Saul is uh, giving his, uh, you might say, his uh, testimony again. He's, he's giving an explanation of his conversion experience again. And in verse 19, as he uh, speaks to a mob in Jerusalem, he says, So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So yes, Saul was there witnessing the death of Stephen 
And he even agreed that Stephen should be executed because he believed in Jesus. Then if you will, go to chapter 26. Chapter 26. Once again, Saul, now called Paul, is giving an account of his conversion experience, this time before King Agrippa and Festus, the governor of Judea. And here in chapter 26, notice verse 9. Uh, Saul, now called Paul, says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So what Saul is saying here is he really, really persecuted the church very hard. I have a few other references. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm just going to refer to them. Um, in Galatians chapter 1, I'll just read this. In Galatians 1 verse 13, I hear Saul, now called Paul, says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And then one more reference here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, uh, the Apostle Paul refers to uh, how much he persecuted the church again. And here he says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse... Uh, nine, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. All right, we've finished the cross references. So now back to Acts chapter 9. So Paul's busy persecuting the church. Christians are suffering under the hand of this fellow by the name of Saul. So God does something about it. It's no problem for God. So in number two, Saul is humbled by the risen Lord. Verses 3 to 5. So let's read this now. Verse 3. So as uh, Saul journeyed, he went from Jerusalem up to Damascus. He's on the way there. I've, I've read it could be about 130 miles or so. Uh, so as he journeyed, he came near to the city of Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. We'll just pause right there in the reading. So a light shines from heaven, and then Saul hears a voice. In the Bible, when a light shines from heaven and there's a great voice, it is God speaking. But in this case, the voice that speaks doesn't say, I am God. The voice that speaks says, I am Jesus. Remember, Jesus was just crucified in Jerusalem a few years earlier. Now Saul has the realization Jesus is not dead. He's alive, and he's on a par of equality with God. So Saul asked that question, who are you, Lord? And then the voice comes back and says, I'm Jesus, and you're trying to persecute me. You know what people do when they persecute Christians? They really are trying to persecute Jesus. But they really can't accomplish anything by persecuting Christians and trying to persecute Jesus. You've heard the old saying that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the growing church. Uh, persecution somehow helps Christians dig in their heels, have all the more resolve in their faith, and grow. So Saul fell to the ground. And Jesus asked the question, why are you persecuting me? Why? Let's think about that for a moment. Normally when questions are asked, they're asked to make us think. Um, I could just say certain things to you in declarative statements, but when I ask a question, now you've got to think because you've got to think of an answer. 
So I think Saul is supposed to be thinking. He's supposed to be thinking here of what he's going to say to the risen Lord that says, well, why are you persecuting me? And I think what Jesus wants Saul to realize is that it's a waste of time, Saul, trying to persecute me. You can persecute me all you want. You can persecute Christians all you want, but it's not going to do any good. Remember what Jesus said to Peter back in Matthew chapter 16? Jesus said to Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell or the gates of death will not prevail against it. So Jesus will in fact build his church and there is nothing anyone can do to stop it. And that's actually a, an argument for the credibility of Christianity here. So uh, Saul uh, is trembling there. And then he finally comes around after he asks, well, who are you, Lord? And he finds out he's speaking to Jesus. Then notice his humility. Lord, what do you want me to do? So now Saul, instead of fighting against Jesus, trying to persecute Christians, trying to persecute Jesus, trying to stamp out the Christian movement and trying to get rid of Christians, now he's saying, Lord, I humbly place myself under your authority and I really want you to know, what do you want me to do? To do. So now we see a humble a Saul who's eager and willing to do what the Lord Jesus Christ is asking him to do. All right, number three. Let's go on to point number three. Let me just slide this up a little bit so you can see. And I'll just put down the rest of the points here, number three. So now Saul is forced to think, he's forced to reflect, and he's going to pray. And notice, if you will, in verse uh, 9... Notice verse 9. Uh, and he was three days without sight, and Saul neither ate nor drank. So he saw this great light. He fell to the ground. He heard Jesus speak to him on the road to Damascus. He understands Jesus is alive, and Jesus has something that he wants him to do. But in the process, uh, God allowed Saul not to be able to see. We might say, that's terrible, he can't see anything. And yes, he has to be led by the hand to go into the city of Damascus and stay at someone's house. But now that he can't see, he's got a lot of time to think. He's not going to be distracted by all the things that he gets to look at. He just has to think about what happened on that road to Damascus. He has to think about his encounter with the risen, living Lord Jesus Christ. He has to think about what it is that God is going to ask him to do, what it is that Jesus is going to ask him to do. So it says there he has no sight. It's interesting, when Saul had his sight, he had his physical sight, he could actually see he was spiritually blind. And right now, Saul can't see with his physical eyes, but now he has spiritual sight. He really can see Jesus for who he is. And that's a good thing. So let's read on. Verse 10. So there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, well, here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So now Saul is praying. Well, as a devout Jew, I'm sure he prayed a lot. And now he's praying. He's probably praying, confessing his sins, confessing his mistakes. He's probably very sorry that he was persecuting the church so vehemently. And he's probably praying, Lord, give me the grace and the courage to do what you're going to ask me to do. So certainly taking time out to reflect on one's life where one has been, where one has been, where one is now, and where one is going is certainly a good thing. So as the story unfolds here, um, Ananias said, uh, Lord, you know, did, do you know who this guy is? <laughs> this guy's one of the biggest persecutors of Christians. And you want me to go visit him at the house of one called Judas on the street called Straight? I don't think that's a good idea, Lord. So the Lord answers Ananias and says, Ananias, it's okay, because Saul is a chosen vessel unto me. I have chosen Saul for a very special ministry and a very special purpose. So now, number four, Saul is given a new mission. Saul is given a new mission. 
Remember, this is the fellow that was deliberately and very purposefully persecuting the church, persecuting Christians. But now notice verse 15. The Lord said to Ananias, go, for he, Saul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So now Saul is going to go out and preach Jesus and announce Jesus to many, many people. So Ananias uh, goes in. He sees Saul, puts his hand on Saul. Saul receives his sight. Saul is baptized, and he receives some food to eat, and he spends time with the disciples, that is, Christians, in Damascus. So number five, what does Saul do now? What's Saul's new occupation, you might say? What's, what's Saul's new ambition in life? What's his new goal? He goes out and he proclaims Jesus as the Son of God, as the Christ, the Messiah, that God sent into the world. So notice verse 20. So immediately Saul preached the Christ. By the way, that little Christ means the Messiah. And based on the Old Testament scriptures, God promised that he would send his uh, Messiah, his, uh, you might say, servant into the world to bring people his salvation. And so he's preaching Jesus as the Christ in the synagogues, uh, and, and, he is the, and that he is the Son of God. To affirm that Jesus is the Son of God is to affirm his divine status as well. It affirms that Jesus came from God, doing God's will, is loved by God the Father, and is in a par of equality with God. So verse 21, then all who heard, that is all who heard Saul preach Jesus, they were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on the, uh, this name, the name of Jesus in Jerusalem? And he's come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound uh, to the chief priest. So people at first were a little scared when they heard Saul is in town, thinking that Saul came to persecute them. But Saul is no longer persecuting Christians. He's one with Christians, believing as they believe, and preaching and proclaiming Jesus Christ. So verse 22 says, So Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. This Jesus is the Messiah. So now in number six, Saul is now going to be persecuted. Remember, Saul was the one doing the persecuting. Now he's going to be persecuted back. Now who's he going to be persecuted by? Well, fellow Jews who don't want to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. Notice verse 23. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. That's right, they plotted to kill Saul. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples, that is Christians, took Saul by night and let him down through the wall in a very large basket. So Saul was let down over the city wall of Damascus, and he was able to escape. And then we read in verse 28, uh, just look at verse 28, so Saul... Uh, he was uh, with Christians at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Verse 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. But when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea, and they sent him out to Tarsus. So they get, they get uh, Saul out of Judea, and they send him back to his hometown in Tarsus for his own safety. So let's wrap this up with some application here. Let me show you my final point here. So, you what? Oh, sorry. Which way? This way? No, the other one. Thank you. Sir. Okay, good. Can see it now? Good. <clears throat> so let's just wrap it up and make some application. So, we learn from this story, as well as throughout the whole Bible, God is sovereign, God is in control, God sees what Saul is doing. And God says, I'm tired of Saul's persecuting uh, the church and persecuting Christians. I'm going to grab up Saul for myself. And so that's what the risen Lord does. In fact, Paul uh, actually says uh, over in Philippians chapter 3 that I was apprehended. I was apprehended by the Lord. Uh, the Lord uh, got hold of me. And that's exactly what happened to him. 
So we need to remember God is sovereign, God is in control of all things, and that's good news. The world isn't spinning out of control, although the world might seem like it's in chaos, God is still God, and God is still watching over the world, and especially watching over us, his people. Letter B, what does this story tell us? Well, it's a strong argument for the credibility of Christianity. And did you notice that in Acts, the conversion of the Apostle Paul was told not once, not twice, but three times. Three times Luke goes out of his way in this narrative to tell us about the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Because next to the resurrection of Jesus in the empty tomb, the change in the lives of the disciples is probably one of the biggest arguments for the credibility of Christianity. In other words, let me put it this way. How do you account for this fellow by the name of Saul who vehemently persecuted the church, how do you account for the fact that he went from being a persecutor of the church to being the biggest defender of Jesus Christ? How do you account for that? Something had to happen. Something must have changed him. Uh, he didn't just, did, he, he, it's not that he just disliked Christians and didn't want to have anything to do with them. He went out of his way to put him in jail, and he wanted him dead. And now he's out preaching Jesus. So, uh, that's a big argument here. Uh, Christianity is real. Uh, it's, it's believable. It's credible. Jesus really is alive. Because look what the Lord Jesus did in the life of Saul. And then my last point, let us see. Well, God can change anyone. If we just believe in him and believe in Jesus, cast our lives upon him, ask for the forgiveness of sins, God can change anyone. And that's really good news. No one is outside or beyond the reach of God's love shown to us in Christ Jesus. So just be encouraged. Uh, God is working in our lives and he's still changing us. He's conforming us into Christ's likeness. That's one of the great joys of being a Christian, learning to love God and learning to love one another as the love of Jesus fills our soul and fills our life. And that's what God wants us to do, not only to believe in him, but to believe in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we believe in Christ as our Savior, who died for us on the cross and paid for our sins, they're all forgiven. And we have new life where we are now able to relate to God Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ. So be encouraged. God is in control. And Christianity is real. May God inspire your faith tonight. Let's pray. Lord God, we bow before you. And we're thankful that you're God. You're God all-powerful. You're God almighty. And you're in charge of everything. And Lord, we just ask that you would nurture our faith tonight. Help us to be strong and resolute in our convictions. I pray that we would keep believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're thankful for this uh, a record of the Saul's conversion. And how it affirms that Jesus is alive and he's powerful. And he really is the one who died for us on, our, on the cross. And he really is the one who was raised again from the dead for us. And he lives for us. So Lord, just bless each and every one that is here tonight in a very special way. We ask this all in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen.